chapter 21, as all children up to sixth grade are dismissed to their service. Uh, if there's any way we can kick the air conditioning, anybody else warm besides me? Okay, maybe it's just me, but it's warm up here. I'm about to kill the coat here in a second. If we can make, just kick it down 20 or 30 degrees. Either way, it's fine. Some of you caught that. Okay, it's too warm. Not even getting the jokes. We're in trouble today. All right, John chapter 21. This morning we're going to continue on our series that we entitled a few weeks ago, Broken, Simply Broken, that God moving us from where we are to where He wants us to be. Today we're going to look at the idea of being broken from a completely different point of view. Put up the message at the next slide. It's got from Peter. Now go back one. Go back one to the, there it is. Peter, from big mouth to broken. All right, that's the title of the message today. If any of you have ever looked at Peter at all, you know he had a bit of a big mouth. All right. I like Peter. He reminds me of me. Loud and obnoxious, all right, and impulsive. A lot like me. But what we're going to do today, today is very different. In, in the past last few weeks under this series, Broken, we have looked at how God took a broken piece and developed it into something amazing. He will do the same thing with Peter. As we know, Peter did great things. But today we're going to see a bit of a different trail. We're going to see Peter, who thought, man, I'm doing great things, became broken and then God could use him. For some of us, God will need to break us. We'll get to that in a second, explain what that means. It sounds horrible. I know that. Not a great introduction to a message because people are ready to leave or watch something else. I don't want to be broken, as the Lord may, as you may say today. Let's look at John 21, verse 15. Uh, John 21, verse 15. Uh, the Bible says this. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon Son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Father, give us wisdom as we look at this entire story today. Help us, Father, to set aside the distractions that inevitably will be there, the things that Satan will do to distract us today from your word. Give us the next 30 to 40 minutes to be able to focus on you and you alone, not on a preacher. Not on anything else, but, Father, on you. Satan will desire, Father, to distract people, to discourage people, uh, to convince them that what they're going to hear today is not true. Lord, may you bind him and may you use your Holy Spirit in our lives today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I'll put something back here. John chapter 21. This story talks specifically about a time after the crucifixion. Peter's been fishing. Jesus comes. It's the second time they've done the miracle where they were able, unable to catch anything. And Jesus said, throw the nets on the other side. Another great drawing. Same way, basically, they were called to be disciples. Then they come back on and Jesus feeds them. They're excited about this. And then this conversation takes place. Interesting at this point, if you were to study this passage at all, you're going to find that Peter at this point is broken for a lot of reasons. And as he stands there, what we're going to look at predominantly here in a few minutes is the fact that I believe Jesus and Peter were viewing this entire conversation completely different points of view. And I think it'll help us to understand. Let me tell you why. We often view God from the human point of view. Have you ever done that? God can't answer my prayer because of, and we have a list of bad things we've done. We ask forgiveness nine times for the same thing. Because we've not forgiven ourselves. We believe God doesn't love us or whatever. Why? Because if somebody did what I did to God, if they did to me, <laughs> I wouldn't forgive them. We often view God through our mindset. And I hope today that we will be able to get a bit of a different view of God in that aspect. What do we mean by the idea of being broken? In introduction, I want to quickly explain this. This is not talking about punishment. That is completely different. That's chastisement. That's different. Broken is basically, to an extent, moldable. I've never worked with, you know, clay and all that other stuff. I lived in the South for a while, and so anytime you dug in the ground, it was clay, all red clay. But you watch, as somebody who's creating pot, pottery, you know what happens when they begin to create it and imperfection comes in that pottery? What do they do? Smack it. They drop it down to nothing so they can start back up. Sometimes, as Christians, we become self-made Christians. We know the right things to say, the right things to do. We know all of that. But we're really not, whether we know it or not, 
allowing God to be the one to direct us. We're convinced of how good we are. I mean, we even tell other people how good we are. And our minds, well, I'm better than so-and-so. You ever done, don't, don't raise your hand. Have you ever done that? I'm better than so-and-so. Okay, let me tell you straight out. You're all better than me, all right? So we're, we can move on from there, okay? Every, if you find somebody that you're better than, who I feel good, then it stinks. A missionary comes in, you find someone better than you, right? If you're comparing, you will always be miserable. You can always find someone worse than you. If you're bad enough, go to Doyle's down to the prison. You can, right? You know, we can always find a reason in our mind. This is not about punishment. This is about just being usable for God. This is about overcoming ourselves and truly committing what we have and who we are to Him. This is about being real, not just about doing what is expected. One of the greatest fears a pastor has is that people come to church for one reason, or acting a certain way. They should. I mean, we're in church. We've got to act a certain way. And yet, we're faking every bit of it. I'm not being critical. We've all been there. I'm not saying it's easy to do. Here's what I'm saying is one of the desires of, for me as a pastor of the church here is not that we all got the good front and everything, everything's everybody's wonderful. That we can come to a church and we can be real between, before God. Right? It's okay to acknowledge we're a sinner because everybody's a sinner. Anytime a preacher does a, a message on sin, you know the invitation is going to be one or two things, really full or empty. You know why is it going to be empty? People say, I'm not going to admit I'm a sinner. People are going to know I'm a sinner. What am I going to do? I, if you're alive, you're a sinner. Okay, we, I, we get that? Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We got past that, all right? I, I really want us to understand just a more realistic aspect of what Christ is looking for. The main thing we will look at here in a little bit, the main phrase that we'll get to in about 15 minutes, is when Paul says this to Jesus, thou knowest. There's some powerful truth behind those two words. Before we can talk about that story, though, I believe it's important for us to get some background. So on your screen, you're going to see some scripture I'm going to read. You can follow along if you want in your Bible. As we look, the first point is this, the path of the broken. The path of the broken. We're going to look at how John or Peter got to this point, starting in Matthew 26, verse 31. The Bible says this, Then saith Jesus unto them, He's talking to his disciples. He's, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock, uh, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. He's talking about the disciples running away from him when he goes to the cross. Verse 32, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, <laughs> yet I will never be offended because of thee. Yet will I never be offended. You get the point, big mouth? All right, you get the point where I'm going here? All right, I'll never. Verse 34, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice or three times. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Once Peter said it, all the men, yeah! It didn't work out that way as we know in the story. In these verses, Jesus tells his disciples they're going to abandon him. It's part of prophecy. It is going to happen. These are times, there are times in our life when we read the Bible or hear it preached and are convinced that what we're being warned about will never happen. We've been there. I can handle it. I know so-and-so fell into it, but I'm better than them. I'm stronger than them. I will never happen. How many times have we sat and listened to a preacher preach the Word of God, and God tells us that's what you're doing? God, I'll, I can handle it. I will never, ever do that. And then six months later, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. Can I tell you? A couple things. The Bible said there's nothing new under the sun. Right? There's no new problems we face today. You say, wait a minute, have you looked at the government? Have you done a study on government history? All right. This is not the first time America's gone through some of these things. But in general, we look and say, ah, we can handle it. The Bible says there's no temptation taking you but what is common to man. Okay, so if someone else can fall to it, so can I. But God is able, who along with the temptation, make a way to escape that I may be able to escape it. So I have the opportunity. But every one of us, if we think we can handle it, then we're going to fall. Before destruction, is the, before the heart of man is haughty. If I'm going to fall, it's because I think I got it. I love watching 
uh, people who before great sports uh, events and they talk about how they're just going to dominate the game. Then they go out there and they look like an idiot. You know, everybody wants. There's a certain athlete that years ago was bragging on how good he was. He was going to take his talents to a certain place, right? And he had an entire ESPN show on how he was just going to dominate. And he goes down, he got two rings, yes. But you know what? It's funny about that. There are more people who wanted to see him fail than do good. Not because they didn't like him. They were annoyed by his attitude on the TV. To this day, people still say they don't like that guy because of what he did. I don't care, all right? I really don't care who, you know, on that aspect. And we can get sometimes too fed up with those things. But that's what we say sometimes as Christians. I can handle this. I won't do this. It's just a little bit. I can control it. Peter said, I can handle that. And he fell into it. In reality, we're really just ignoring God because God is not a preacher who tells you right or wrong. It's God, the Holy Spirit. We hear the truth, and we even know the truth, but we refuse to respond to it. We, we honestly just can't see how we would ever, ever do that, how that could ever happen to us. Unfortunately, we think that, but then too many of us fall into it. Let me give you a very silly example, okay? Wives, you will fully understand where I'm coming from. All right, the wife comes in, and she needs the trash taken out. The next morning is trash day. She walks in to the living room. Her husband's watching TV. She says, "Hon, today, tomorrow's trash day. Can you take, take the trash out? And he uses the inevitable phrase that just basically makes the woman's ears want to bleed. Sure, I'll get to it. Some of you women are just getting annoyed right now, right? He's not going to get to it. You know that, right? And he's over there. I have every intention. When this is done, I know I can pause it and get up, but I'm comfortable, okay? When I get up to get my snack, I'll take care of it. And in his mind, he is convinced he's going to do it. And then when he gets up to get the snack, he steps over the trash bag, right? And he sits back down. He kicks it. Oh, yeah, I got to get to that. And the wife's watching from a distance, pulling hair out, right? She's braiding the daughter's hair. and almost yanks the daughter's hair out. Just clean it up, right? We as husbands are convinced I'm going to do it. And the wives are over there. It's not going to happen. But I can't. I, I got to be nice. Because if I get in his case, he's going to yell at me. I don't know. So we go to bed. And then at 6 o'clock, or at 7 o'clock in the morning, when you hear the trash guy coming down the street, all of a sudden the husband, no! You say, how do you know this? Oh, I've done that. I'm, I'm telling you what happened to me two weeks ago, okay? My wife kindly walked away and said, your problem, not mine. And just walked away, right? I had to fix it. We, we can do that all the time. I got it handled. You know, with God, it's much more serious. It's not about what a preacher says. It's about what Holy Spirit's teaching us. The second thing is, what do we do when we have been proven wrong? What happens? Okay, God told me to do this. I wouldn't. I've fallen. Man, what do I do? Let's look what John. What happened. John 21, verses 1 through 3, which actually is at the beginning of the chapter you're in. If you want to go back just a page. Verse 1, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, after these things, after Jesus had died, after Peter had denied him three times. Remember in the story? He was there and people said, are you not one of his followers? Not only did he say no, he cursed to say no. Verse 20, verse 20 goes, after these things, Jesus showed himself unto the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed him he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say to him, well, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. You know what he did? I'm going back to what I know. You know what happens when we mess up? God has said something. We've denied it. We've messed up. We walk away. I failed. God's right. I give up. It's not out of anger. It's not a frustration. Often it's out of just our own personal regret guilt, things of that nature. And Satan's got us. He makes us feel guilty. You're horrible. God told you not to do it. You did it. Oh, you feel guilty. And he just beats us up horribly. So we just go back. We go back away from church. We go back to what we were before we met God. Why? Because Satan's got us. And we are so convinced we failed, we don't want to fail again. Peter went back fishing. He had all the opportunities and he went back fishing. When things get hard, we believe that God doesn't care. When we do our own things and blow it, we go back to letting our flesh make the decisions and sometimes even blame God. In reality, 
We feel like we have failed God, and we don't want to ever feel that way again. So what happens? We find ourselves back to where we were before we met God. What do we do? Now to the main point of the message. Fortunately, God is not done with us, and maybe that is exactly right here is exactly where God wants us. How could that be? How could God want me in this spot? Number two, the power of the Savior. Verse 20, chapter 21, verse 15. They just dined. Jesus asks Peter a question. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou these more than these? He being Peter saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Before we get into the points here, real quick, I need to explain something. In our English words that were translated love, there is really no translation for all of the words in Greek for love. In Greek, there's multiple words, and they all are translated love, but they mean different things. So let me give you a breakdown without going too deep and boring you, all right? Let me give you a breakdown. The word agape, how many of you ever heard the word agape? That sounds okay. That is divine God-given love. That is the love that the husband is commanded to give to his wife. Agape love. More than anything. A love that would you give up anything, you would die for that person. So Jesus says, do you agape me more than these fish, than your old life? Peter comes back and he uses a different word. We in this area are very familiar with that word. The word, Greek word is phileo. The word we get Philadelphia from, the city of brotherly love. Sometimes brotherly shove, but the word means that, all right? That is the idea. So here, now brotherly love is affection. Uh, and we have an affection for each other. I don't really know you that well, but I, I appreciate you. Go, we go to the same church. We have an affection. We appreciate that. That's the extent of it. So God says, do you love me with the divine godly love more than anything else? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I like you. A lot of people will go back and criticize Peter. How dare he say that? Let me tell you why he said that. It all comes down to one thing. What did he say before he said, I, lo I love you, I, I like you? He says, thou knowest. We're going to look at a couple of things that God knew. Number one, Jesus knew his failure. Jesus knew the failure of Peter. Imagine what Peter must have been thinking when he said these words. God, you know what I did. You know who I really am. You know how badly I failed. You know how selfish I was. You know how afraid I was. Peter argued, remember? He once argued with Jesus, I'll never do this. And then he failed. He wasn't about to do it again. He said, Jesus, you know everything. You watched my actions, and you asked me a word that you know in your divine sovereignty that I can't answer because you saw what I did. What, a, what an amazing. He knew his failure. So many times we get upset and we run away and say, I don't ever want God to find this out. Do you know that God knows it? Let me tell you something that is going to blow your mind, all right? It's, it's comforting to me and discouraging at the same time. Sometime this week, you're going to mess up somewhere, okay? I won't ask you to raise your hands. I'm just going to tell you, we're all going to mess up. We're human. We are going to sin sometime this week. You don't have to, but we will. Let me tell you something. Thursday afternoon when you mess up, God already knows today what you're going to do. Think about it. God already knows today what you're going to do Thursday. Thou knowest, Lord, what I've done. We try to hide from God, and it's the most feeble thing we can ever do is try to hide from God. You ever played hide-and-seek with your kids? I love playing hide-and-seek with my kids. It's the, one of the easier jobs. My youngest one is not here, so I can say that. Okay, go hide. And they just run in a circle in the living room, Right? We first moved into our house. The new we had to do a lot of changes and some lighting. So in one of our rooms, we had this you know long skinny lamp post that was the light for the living. So we say we're gonna play hide and seek. And so I'm counting one, two, three, fifteen, thirty, forty-two, forty. You know, like that. He can't count. All right. I say, ready or not, here I come. I turn around and there he is with the skinny pole. So you know what we do as parents, right? I wonder where he is. And so we pull the couch back, and I look in the fireplace and open the refrigerator, and all that time he's sitting there, you know? Then I walk right past him, and he slowly turns around the pole. 
I walk upstairs. <laughs> then I come down. He goes, boo! And what do you think every parent does? Oh, I didn't see you there. Let's do it again. That was great. Of course, if I hide, I grab a snack, I you know, sit right next to the couch, and he's never going to find me. So we do that for hours. It is the easy game. Do you know, that's silly for most adults. A great time with your kid, by the way. Do you know, when we try to hide for God, that's literally how silly it is. We're standing behind a pole where we, God can see everything, and he's like, really? Remember Adam when he hid from God? God says, why do you hide? God knew exactly where he was. He was asking Adam, what are you doing? That's exactly where Peter was. Peter says, Lord, you know my failure. Thou knowest. Aren't you glad that God knows? Aren't you glad you serve a God who's omniscient, who knows everything? Second thing, and let me give you this principle. I, I think it's important. Remember, failure is not an end in and of itself. But it was, it's a realization of how badly I need Jesus. That is the difference in thinking. I fail, I'm going to give up. You know what God says? Oh, I knew you were going to fail. And you're going to fail again. And you know what? Catch this. I am going to use your failure for good. Did you catch that? He's going to use my failure for good. I can't fail bad enough to not be used by God. Because my failure can still be used for God. Number two, Jesus knew his fear. Peter was convinced that if he continued to try on his own, he was just going to keep messing up. You remember the story. When he failed, when he, when he denied Jesus, Jesus looked at him. Oh, can you imagine the eyes of Jesus looking at you after you have just denied him? I mean, there are times God asked me to witness to somebody, and I'm like, oh, I'm nervous, I'm nervous, and I walk and I feel bad. I can't imagine having denied it in his presence and then looking him in the eye. He knew his fear. Let me tell you something. We, God knows our fear. God knows we're afraid to mess up. God knows we're afraid to look silly. God knows we're afraid of all kinds of stuff. When I ask teenagers after camp to come give testimonies, you know what? What if I mess up? As adults, we're saying, that's the best part, all right? But teenagers, I don't want to mess up. You know, what if I trip up the stairs? I've watched that happen. It's funny. Dr. Comfort years ago told me a story. In my last church, shortly after, before I got there, they had redone the auditorium. Before that, I don't know why they did this, but there, were a, there was three steps about three feet wide right here. So on either side, there was no step down to the platform. And if you ever watched Dr. Comfort, he's been here. He quotes his scripture when he's reading. Instead of reading the Bible, he quotes the text. He's got so much memorized. It's just amazing. So he told me the story. He came back to ambassador. He sat down. He goes, you've got to hear this. I laughed because it's not funny. I'm like, it's already in here, it's all right? So he tells me, he's quoting the story, he's quoting the Bible. He walks over, he's quoting, and he takes a step down to the step that's not there. And he falls, hits his head while quoting. He said, I got back up, I'm checking for blood while quoting scripture. He said, about three people noticed. The rest of the people are very studiously watching, you know, having no idea. <laughs> How do you miss that, all right? And he's walking around, and the rest of the service, he's feeling warm spots, making sure he's not bleeding. No one noticed that he took a nosedive off the platform. And I said, Dr. Kevin, that's hilarious. He goes, no, it's not. Like, you would laugh at me. You know it. We all are going to make mistakes. One of the things years ago, when I first became pastor, many of you know, my greatest strength is not speaking. God gave me a really bad job for that, all right? So I make mistakes. And he, shortly after he became pastor, I made a mistake in the middle of preaching, and I just like, oh, good night. And I just started laughing at it. I thought, what am I going to do? You're all laughing at it. Why can't I enjoy it too, right? After the service, Mrs. Eckert caught me, and she goes, thank you so much for laughing at yourself. She goes, it just makes me feel more comfortable and realize we don't have to be perfect. I'll never forget that, because we often want to be so perfect we don't let God be in control. Number three. Let, let me read this other principle. In reality, Peter had, excuse me, Peter had a wrong view of what Jesus was thinking. Peter was convinced that Jesus was focused on the failure. Jesus was actually focused on his future. Peter's saying, thou knowest what I've done. And he's convinced, God, I know you're looking at my failure. And Jesus says, oh, no, 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 no. I know what you've done. It's okay. I've got a plan for you. Feed my lambs. 
They were looking at this conversation from two completely different points of view. Peter at a failure, Jesus at a guy he loved who he knew could do great things. Remember, Jesus knew what Peter would do. Jesus knew that one day Peter would die upon a cross upside down because he didn't want to die the same way Jesus did. Jesus knew that most of the men standing watching this conversation would give their life for him. He knew that. So when he says, lovest thou me, he was just trying to show, I accept exactly the way you are. But I still have something great for you. We look at Jesus and we say, we failed. Jesus, no, we failed, so we must move forward. Jesus now had Peter where he needed him to be willing to be honest and not trust in his own ability. Lord, you know... Jesus already knew that. I'm not telling him he didn't know. I have finally acknowledged. Jesus, you know who I really am. So here comes the really big question as we finish. The next big question Jesus asked to Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Do you love me more than you do that? He got him to a place of brokenness. He got him to a place to acknowledge failure is not the end. He got him to a place to say, Lord, I have messed up. I can't really serve you. And then he asked really the most important question of the entire conversation. Do you love me, Jesus, more than you do your job? The money. Do you love me more than these? What is meant by this phrase? In this case, he's talking about fishing to Peter, his career, his life, all that he knew. To truly serve the Lord, we cannot be held back. Let me give you a couple thoughts in today's principle of what it means to love him more than these. What are some of the these? Let me give you the first one. I'm to love him more than I do my family. That's crazy. Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. He said, why? God told the husband to love the wife. Now he's telling him to hate the wife? See, he contradicted himself. No. You know what he's saying? You need to love God so much that in comparison, it's like hate towards your family. I love God so much more than I ever do my family. Got singles in here looking for a husband or a wife, let me give you one bit of advice. Find someone who loves God more than they do you. All right? And if you don't, then go find someone who does. Find someone who loves God more than they do you. And then when you do, you found someone who's going to stand strong and going to follow. Then he says more than money. 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root. By the way, money's not the root of evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Some say, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have, it's not a problem. The love of money. You can be broke and still love money. You can be filthy rich and have the right balance. It's the love of money. You know why? Because that love of money compels me to be so busy doing that I don't give. I could never give any offering plate. I have this and this and this and this and this. I love my money more than I do God. See, preacher, it's not that easy. Yes, it is. If you trust God and you believe God and you love God, it's that easy. It's we who make it hard. So you haven't seen my bills. I don't need to see your bills. God does. I don't need to see those other things. You know what I've learned? God allows me to do so much more with the 80-some percent that I have left over than I could ever do with my 100%. But it comes down to a measure. You say, why would God do this? It's a measure. How do I know who I love more unless I put some action behind it? More than pleasure. The idea of giving up to serve the Lord, is it worth what it may take? Can I give one to you that's going to blow your mind a little bit? Do you love him more than your sin? You say, what? Hebrews 12, 1, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and that sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. He tells me to lay aside the sin that easily besets me. You know what that is? That sin that I know that no one else knows about that is just something I struggle with, I deal with all the time, something that I have control over because he told me to set it aside. Do I love him more than my sin? Here's the question as we finish. Do you really love the Lord that much? I mean, really, have a love that has no limitations or requirements upon him. Peter was in a place where Jesus is going to use him greatly, and he had to make some decisions. 
He had to trust in the Lord, not himself. Trust in God, not in his job. Jesus knew the true heart of Peter. He knew what Peter could not see. Jesus knew what answer he would give, and Jesus knew what Peter would ultimately do. He got him broken so that now he could turn Peter in, not to the big mouth, who walked around and said, God, I'll never turn you down. I'll never deny you. But the one who would stand up in Acts 2 and preach to thousands of people and 3,000 people would get saved. He needed that Peter. He needed that Peter who would go to jail and be fine with it. He needed that Peter. And he needed to get Peter to this point before he could ever be usable here. Some of you, I tell you, we, we go through some battles and it stinks. I love the song she sang a little earlier. Be not afraid, for I am with, I am with you. I have called you by name. Think about it. He called you by name. What an amazing thought. He knows my name. He knows everything about it. Everything about me. He created me. He knows all my weaknesses. He gave them to me. He knows all the times I made mistakes. They're usually his fault, right? Because he gave me those weaknesses. And he wants to use me. Sometimes he may have to break me. Let me tell you what. You know what I do? I can just come to him. I don't have to be broken. I come to him with the broken pieces. Let me ask you, how do we know for sure if we love him? I like what it says in John. He says, greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. Now, we look at that as God's love for us, which is true because Jesus died upon the cross. But you know what God's asking us to do? To lay down all of our own personal desires for him, our life for him. When I'm willing to lay that down for him, then I've proven that kind of love. You see, it's not that easy, preacher. I didn't say it was easy. I said it's doable. And when we lay it down, let me tell you what happened. I lay down my life for him and I give it to him. Then he will give me abundant living. Didn't he, not, didn't he not say he came to give life more abundantly? This is how we get there. I must come to him though. And I must be willing to say, Lord, it's yours. So what if I mess up? Psalm 7, 37, 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, and he will. He shall not be utterly cast down. Why? For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. You know when I fall? I'm just falling into the hand of Jesus. Think about it. When you mess up and fall, you're just falling into the hand of Jesus. What an amazing truth. He's never going to move it. He's never going to look down and say, how dare you do this? He's going to hold me there until I get back up and keep going. A just man falls seven times and rises back up. Just give it to God. Lovest thou me more than these. And Peter said, Thou knowest. Father, we love you. We thank you for the truths of the Word of God this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege we've had to study it. To look, Lord, in depth at a conversation that you and your disciple had. Father, it is such an amazing thought. As Peter says, Lord, Thou knowest. You knew. You knew everything. That was the whole reason you were there. The Father, Peter needed to be in a place where he could be usable. Father, even to those of us who are walking with you, need to always be broken, always be allowing you to mold our future. For those in this room who are holding on, they're missing out on great blessing or what you could really do because they're like Peter. They're so convinced how good they are and they've not become broken. Father, there's some in here who are completely broken. And today, maybe they come and they need to give it to you. Maybe there's someone here who aren't saved. And that's exactly what they needed to get saved. Lord, you know what is needed in this auditorium this morning. I do not. But Father, I would pray that in these next few moments that you would move. I have done what I can. And what I can do is only just to give a message. It is you that will work. Father, may we at Ben Salem Baptist Church this morning respond as you'd have us to. With your head bowed and eyes closed, please, no one looking around. In just a second, we'll sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. I want to ask two questions. First one is this. Do you know for sure you're saved? If you died today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? Do you know that Savior that knows your name? Do you know that Savior that loves you? Do you know, do you know that Savior that will always forgive you no matter what? Or are you, have you been introduced to that God who is overbearing, the God of religion? Do you know Jesus as your Savior, one who loves you and cares for you? If not, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand at this moment. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If God has spoken in your heart and say, Preacher, I need to know about eternity. In a moment, as we begin to sing, I'm going to be on the floor in front of the pulpit. If you would just come, introduce yourself to me, and I will introduce you to someone who will take you to a side room and will just share some scripture with you. And when you look at the scripture, you will make a decision what you will do with Jesus. We will not embarrass you. 
this should be a great chance for you to say, Lord, to, to learn about how much the Lord loves you. Maybe the question's been asked today, lovest thou me more than these? And God is asking you that question. Every one of us have to ask that. And maybe God has specifically spoken to something in your life where he has asked you to deal with it and you've chosen to say, don't worry, Lord, I will never mess up in that area. And now you look back at the phrase, thou knowest. Maybe you're not at that point yet. See, I don't ever want to be there. I don't know what it would be. I don't want to try and create a scenario. Here's what I want to do is I want you, if God has spoken to your heart, to respond. I encourage you to come here to the platform, an old-fashioned altar here in just a moment. You say, preacher, I can't do that. Then kneel at your pew. Here's the important part. Just respond if God's speaking to you. And let God have his way with you. Lord, I pray you bless in the next few moments. I pray we respond as you'd have us to. Father, I pray for Ben Salem Baptist Church and for those here today. Lord, you know the needs. You know all the needs of those in this building. You know the hearts of those in this building. 